Okay, so first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to this uh, yeah, uh, reprise, we would call it in <laughs> Serbian, of the guest lecture. And it, pro it is going to be a little bit different probably because it never can be the same. And uh, yeah, what I wanted to say is this is the title, but it may not be really covering exactly how it will be. I didn't want to change the title. It could be uh, really about the ecologies of reintegration, but it could be a little bit more about play. Depends. We will see. So, uh, so this is what I said anyway. So what I will present a, is inspired by the pedagogical approach to, and I call it ECUE, which means uh, early childhood upbringing and education. Uh, using that, and you will hear why a little bit later, instead of ECEC, -E uh, more known today here, by uh, my mother, Alexandra or Sanda Marjanovic. Um, everybody knew her as Sanda since she was a child. But of course, professionally, she signed everything as Alexandra Marjanovic, and all her works were published in uh, Serbo-Croatian as A. Marjanovic. Uh, which created a big problem for me when I started publishing because when my works were published as A. Marjanovic, everybody thought it was my mother. <laughs> <laughs> now it would be the opposite because people uh, here and in the United States know me as A. Marjanovic Shane, but they would still think it was me, that uh, her works. So I decided actually to call her Sanda all the time and in my bibliographies to put S. Marjanovic for her just to make sure that Although some of my colleagues don't agree with that because she, in Serbian uh, she is published as A. As a Marjanovic. Mm -hmm. And of course uh, my own uh, studies of play and metaphor as meaning making ontological and epistemological praxi practices are also um, the uh, inspiration for this talk today. So I will talk about diverse potentials of play and playful practices in education. and. Uh, can, is play an instrument, a tool for achievement of unrelated adult-imposed educational goals? And how is that achieved? And there were some talks in these two past days that addressed the same issue briefly. Or can we use the play as a dynamic principle of meaning making and import it in education as a kind of principle or set of principles, how to actually have a meaningful meaning making processes, uh, meaningful for the students or the children there. When I say that, I, that, I mean that specifically from their point of view. Uh, that can recreate education into an open meaning making praxis with the potential of reintegrating childhood into the larger social cultural sphere. Uh, which is always the goal of education to kind of bring children into the ethical, moral, civil, uh, and uh, adult human life as integrated in the society. At the same time, the way how they're growing up is segregated from the society. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I will present more uh, closely um, the main thesis of Sanders' emerging pedagogical approach to emancipate childhood through its deinstitutionalization de and emancipation into a larger social cultural sphere through open education. This is a little bit tautological. And her pedagogical credo, uh, education as an open system. We'll talk about what that could mean. Uh, she sees that uh, the problem of the current state of early childhood has historical roots, as uh, Alicia also was talking about, very much in the same way. And that uh, yeah, uh, I'll talk about her thesis that human development or development as a human uh, is based on the significance of creativity. It's not only hers. She based it on a whole lot of uh, previous uh, 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 philosophers and uh, psychologists, we'll talk about it more. And uh, uh, she critiqued, and I'll tell why, the ECUE upbringing and education as a critique, uh, critiquing it as a closed system now, which uh, is uh, uh, segregating children and segregating the adults from the children. Okay. Um, 
So the open upbringing and education and education could support the full development of lichnost. And I'm going to be shameless like the Russians are shameless. This is both Russian and Serbian word. Uh, roughly, it could be translated as personality, but I'll talk more about it, why it has a little bit different connotations in Slavic languages than in English, maybe in, or in Norwegian too, and, as well as development of the communities. And we can look at one complete example of an open uh, uh, pedagogical practice in the work of Školigrica. It's a playful name uh, of that cultural center coined from two words school, škola, and igra, which in Slavic languages means play. So it's kind of like a school play. It's like play world, but not the world, but school play. Yeah, 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 right? Uh, which was uh, opened uh, by my friend uh, and colleague Ljubica Beljanski Ristic, and existed for 25 years in Belgrade as a cultural center for preschool children. Okay, and the, uh, at the end I could just have a little kind of like a, what would Sanda think of my work after she died? Uh, <laughs> so kind of like I'll just go through the list of what I have done and, and imagine what she would think about that <laughs> or while well, I stood there. Because uh, many, in many ways everything that I'm doing really is uh, coming from uh, a lot of her thoughts, diverging from her thoughts, getting reintegrated <laughs> back into her thoughts and flying further I would think, yes. Uh, and uh, I would love if she could see that. Okay, so um, I, I will talk about Lichnost. Okay, so I will present my mother to you the way how she looked when I was a kid and when she was about 35 years old uh, in the 60s when she started actually working on this big project that she had. I still have that brooch and I wear it very often, but not here, <laughs> I don't have it here. So this is a, yeah, she promoting a child's right to be supported in seeking their unique personal life plan. And so this is one of her main views that people have to find, uh, I was saying that to Ellen, have to find their personal life compass to relate to themselves, to others and the reality and, and create their uh, kind of life plan. Like, I, you know, we all ask children, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> and we always have in our minds something we want to be further and making life plans. And that begins very e early and it's a very important part of growing up. Who you, how you construct your subjectivity today in today's world would be in Sanders uh, views, a life plan, who you are. Uh, I also uh, use this life plan in a different way from the Fatimian <coughs> point of view uh, to talk about person idea, the Bakhtinian point of view, uh, Mikhail Bakhtin, the Rus Russian philosopher, uh, uh, has talked about the the concept that no ideas are unembodied in people, they are embodied in people, and that people are embodied ideas. And so he called that person idea. It's a, con a conceptual new concept. She called it maybe life plan. I don't know, when I translate it from Serbian, it doesn't sound so, but when I uh, use her words, it kind of like hits for me something in that, okay? Uh, so, I will give you a little about her history because I want to present her as an embodied person idea. Okay? So that you could feel where her heart was beating when she was doing that. Oh. So, she was born in a very small town in Croatia, looked like that, uh, end of the 19th century. She was born in 22, 1926, and didn't change at that time much from there, and even today, the center of the city, you know, restored like that, so it looks similar like that. It's uh, somewhere near, uh, between Belgrade and Zagreb. Belgrade is a 
capital of Serbia now, Zagreb was the east capital of Croatia, somewhere halfway through. And the, uh, she was born in a very wealthy family uh, <laughs> that became wealthy in the 10 years before she was born. And the, uh, uh, she was pampered. She had a nanny. Uh, she, uh, <laughs> she had like every outfit fit, pair of shoes, something like that, which is a testimony of some people who knew her. And this is in one of her uh, winter Mast ball presentations <laughs> as a Mozart. <laughs> yes, it looks like a Mozart. <laughs> yes, you know there there is a uh, uh, a uh, uh, these mass ball present uh, mass balls are a tradition in a way <laughs> in the winter time uh, in many like in Rio, <laughs> but this was in Vinkovci, her hometown. And then, when she was 15 and a half, 16, the horrible Second World War came. She was uh, born in a family that was not Croatian, but half Serbian and half Jewish. And the uh, Croatian nationalists and Nazis were out there to kill both of us, or to displace them. So she and her family were put in a concentration. She and her immediate mother and father were put in the Croatian concentration camp. Uh, fortunately and luckily they escaped uh, and they were able, so I'm just uh, see, uh, put, uh, giving you a map here, they were able to come to Belgrade at the, uh, after Belgrade was bombed and this was in the center city Belgrade in 1941, like a really center center of the city. The hotel there fortunately was not bombed and it's still in the same way close to that. And they, were, they came to Belgrade without anything, with two small, uh, three small backpacks on their backs that almost contained nothing because even what they took from home when they were taken was confiscated by the Nazis. That was one thing, so they had to start from scratch, everything in their lives. And the second thing is that her uh, extended family, everyone, both mm -hmm. Serbs and Jews, were killed and perished in that war. Mm -hmm. Okay, and among them, it was her most favorite, favorite cousin, Raoul, who was seven years old at that time, and she was like in love with that boy. <laughs> mm -hmm. And for the next ten years, she and her mother, my grandmother were searching for him because he was the only one about whom they did not know how he died or whether he died because he was taken to Dachau. Everybody else was like killed right away. Okay. So they at least knew, you know, when you don't have a closure, you, uh, you try to. So she organized for, uh, so she was uh, uh, about seven years older than Raoul. And she was like, he was her dog. She did everything for him. She organized his life. She, they were very close. And it was uh, that, I think, motivation that uh, uh, put her into uh, this uh, urge to save the children, mm -hmm. to, to, to emancipate the childhood, uh, upbringing, education, the conditions, the ecology, like what they could experience in life. Mm -hmm. to become able to defend themselves, to uh, be strong. <clears throat> and the, uh, her profound empathy came to this uh, really lost children. So right after the, even during the war, as she was becoming 18, 19, she was engaged with work with young children in, uh, in orphanages. There were a lot of them. Mm -hmm. And right after the Second World War, uh, she was part of the, at that time, Communist Party that became uh, uh, the party that won the elections. And she was put to work and wanted to work in the sector of early childhood education, taking care. So she was, uh, she became a um, um, editor of the uh, sector for children's literature. Mm -hmm. and working with the writers, with uh, other people, creating new books for, the, for Yugoslavia, for children. 
and uh, in various different other organizations that worked for children before she then uh, went back to school and graduated and then got PhD in 1961 and started to work in the Department of Education at the University of Belgrade. So this is when she was 16, oh. sometimes during the war, mm -hmm. uh, 17 or something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my favorite photographs. Yeah. <laughs> yes. It's gorgeous. Yes. It's wonderful that you have the photos yes. because oh. with that tragedy, you, yes. you, all those beautiful yes. things get lost. Yeah. Yeah. So her commitment was uh, to envision a world. And this is she and me and my brother. Oh. <laughs> for children, a new world for children. Yeah. So we're looking all into this new world future here. It's kind of cool. Yes. Uh, so a world in which a child can author his or her personality mm -hmm. or richness, be in charge of themselves. Mm -hmm. um, today, maybe we could call it agency too. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, that uh, concept did not mm -hmm. exist, maybe mm -hmm. self efficacy, all these psychological mm -hmm. concepts that existed. Yeah. Uh, so that the child's life can strongly be reconnected to his or her family. With that loss of family, mm -hmm. uh, imagining what would it be to suddenly be left mm -hmm. without any. Love, loving people mm -hmm. to protect you and to be a child then. And uh, <clears throat> the child should not be in a closed institution cut off from her family society in the world, mm -hmm. but right there in the center. <clears throat> uh, the child should be deeply intertwined with the society and its culture. Mm -hmm. uh, completely, that's kind of like a broad, broadly painting the picture of her vision. And uh, the child can be a full-fledged participant in the society's public sphere of this choice mm -hmm. and not segregated or mm -hmm. uh, put at a lower pedestal than anybody else. And the child is supported in pursuing and creating his or her own life plan by creating his or her own person and relationship with others and the world. Mm -hmm. So that's the main goal then of our bringing in education in the early childhood education to support mm -hmm. people creating their own life plan mm -hmm. as a people. So let's see where does that come theoretically from. Uh, this is just very quickly. Uh, she read broadly and widely. Uh, she was lucky that she was bilingual from the very early childhood, or maybe even tri trilingual. But she did speak several Croatian until seven years of age. When she went to school, she spoke German okay. because her family from the Austro-Hungarian Empire thought that that's the language of the uh, world. At that time, German was much more dominant than English. Mm -hmm. Everybody had to learn German. That was what you need to do. Plus, they were then to speakers of uh, uh, Austrian German or maybe Yiddish, uh, definitely Yiddish for my grandmother and her, my mother's grandmothers. Mm -hmm. I always thought that it was Yiddish, but she assured me that not broken German Yiddish, but German, mm -hmm. <laughs> a language of their house. I think later, many, many years later in my life, I discovered that maybe my grandmother spoke to me German because when I started learning German from scratch as an adult person and thinking that I don't know any German, I learned it so fast. It was like waking up. Wow. Yes. So she must have, uh, she, my grandmother died when I was three years old, so I didn't have memories of that. Mm. Uh, so uh, she read philosophy, so psychology, sociology, political science. So she read in German. She learned. She spoke French, she spoke English, she spoke mm -hmm. Russian. Oh. So uh, she could uh, read all these sources. And she read literature, poetry, art, drama, music. It was important because she was really before coming into education part of a sector of culture for children. Mm -hmm. So all of that that you heard yesterday, especially in the concluding panel, how arts and education could be connected, mm -hmm were just really deep uh, uh, issues that we discussed in the house over and over and over again. Mm. Because there is a different 
orientation in these two. And some people even think it's impossible to put them together, especially Niels mm -hmm. yesterday was very skeptical. Can you do that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that issue is very important there. Um, she also was very much inspired by humanist Marxist philosophy and critique of the dogmatic economic Marxism, which Alicia addressed, mm. in, 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 you addressed it in your speech. Mm. And my mother was a part, uh, not central part, of a group of philosophers that were all over Yugoslavia creating this new approach to life, new humanistic philosophy. They, re they were called Praxis, the group, uh, and uh, they were among our household friends. We went to summers with them. They had the conferences where Marcuse would come uh, or somebody else uh, from, I don't know who else. I was little. So for me, they were just a bunch of old people. At that time. <laughs> <laughs> and I was much more interested in, in the children of these people. We were about 10, 11, 12, mm. starting to flirt with each other and things like that in the summers. But mm. for them, it was the philosophy that they were developing, which was uh, really a break from traditional Marxism, very non-communist at that time. And uh, so they were people who were building the new world. Yeah. And she was part of that and uh, part of that philosophy. And she was also very active in, as an educator and pedagogue. Uh, she was uh, part of the uh, uh, reform of public preschool education. She actually mm -hmm. founded the Department of Preschool Education within the Department of Education. She was the head of that uh, mm -hmm. there. And she collaborated with everyone else, not just in Serbia as a local republic, but uh, in Croatia, Slovenia, Macedonia, and all of the now different states of Yugoslavia that were in Yugoslavia. And so it was very interesting that uh, they created at one point uh, two models of, for the ministry. So instead of having one set of guidelines from the ministry, there was a model A and the model B. She was the author of the model A, which was the whole uh, person approach. Well, model uh, B was more cognitive, uh, mm -hmm. developing skills mm -hmm. and things like that, like measurable things. But she was the other side. So the and the preschool institutions, each one of them could choose which model they want to choose for their guidelines. <laughs> Great in Yugoslavia mm -hmm. at that time. That doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> but that was uh, maybe 1975, and then it was couple of times uh, revised the uh, Model A itself uh, uh, later on, even after her death, but mm. today it's not existing. Oh. So the, this is where her, her background comes from in developing her theories and her perspectives. Mm. So uh, what could it mean to create a new society, a new polity completely? And uh, I think that was also the question in the conference that we were here mm. throughout the day. I can't believe that the 70, from 1975 or 60s, uh, we are developing and we are constantly still searching. Uh, but they were in, a, in this country that was not alive. It was not part of the Soviet Union bloc. It was not part of the Western bloc. They were really kind of like authors of the new society. Mm -hmm. And especially what would it mean for the early childhood upbringing and education? In, which was her concern. So, um, first of all, to support each person's development as a richness, in their quest to create their own way of relating to the world, others, and self. That, that was in the core of everything. And to keep searching for designing and living one's own life plan, to, to be uh, given respect to do that, honor to do that, and that again now connects with Alicia's talk about living beyond the bare necessities. What drives you should be transcending just the economic necessities of life, because mm -hmm. economic necessities of life with their problem solving bind us and uh, take uh, the freedom of being human away from us. Being human is more than that. Creating culture, creating ideas, creating what if worlds, that's where very important thing, uh, imagination and play come in. 
is what makes us human. Mm -hmm. so we can all live on the bare necessities. And in that sense, uh, we are all the same and objective in a measure. But in transcendence to the humanity plan, each one of us becomes a unique person, not alike to anybody else, and human in that sense. <clears throat> so, uh, emancipation of people enables them to continue freely creating their lives in multiple spheres of culture and life. Having that freedom of uh, imagining and making true something that was not true yesterday. And that's what is the, the kind of like in the core of this idea. And uh, human practices and relationships are guided by self-determination. Let me see why I put this. I, I, my, my glasses don't let me read from my computer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, either on the computer or the internet. Um, uh, Self-determination, I want to talk about that uh, uh, just a little second. For those of you who don't know, maybe some of you know, Yugoslavian flavor of socialism was based on self-management and self-determination. That was the ideology of the country. It was not centralized approach from the, uh, from the party heads and the uh, committees uh, then imposing on everybody else. Mm -hmm. But in 1964, there was a reform, or maybe even before, where the main ideology be became self-management of every uh, institution, every agency, and, and that self-management, or in Serbian, samo upravljanje, maybe Alicia can figure that out, <laughs> uh, was... Some words are completely different. Yes, uh, very, very different. Like yes. some are kind of very yes. similar. So yes. Yeah. So it was very much also in line with what everybody else on the political, economic, and other level was uh, trying to figure out how can we achieve that and live as a society too. So that's why this asterisk, mm -hmm. I just wanted to say it was not so kind of outlandish. And it's not individualistic mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. We'll mm -hmm. talk about what it means, self-determination. Uh, as, as a social category, not as individual category. Mm. Uh, so that everybody can then engage in the multiplicity of interests, desires, passions, projects, etc. And to transcend the principle of biological evolution driven by the necessities in which only the fittest can survive. Mm. And so it is transcending the classical Marxist dogma that the uh, means of production uh, determine all our relationships and our societies and how they work. No, we are free of that. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. So by actively participating in creating culture both in the community and in self. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, that's uh, uh, you will see that creativity and the imagination and play are central for this, completely mm -hmm. central. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here is per pedagogical credo. I will just go very fa fast. Uh, that uh, emancipation of early childhood upbringing and education has to go from the institutionalization and segregation driven by the life necessities and the oppressive economic relationships to an open societal, lifeful, creative pedagogical practice that's creative in itself, because then it's culture making too. Uh, and not pre set pre given. Mm -hmm. And the ch children's life problematics, that's the expression I couldn't find a way how to translate. But issues of real life. Mm -hmm. And I can only find mm -hmm. out, uh, for, connect that to, um, again, Alicia, <laughs> you're so central here, uh, your gore play or, or dark play. Uh, and your analysis of the uh, how this uh, beautiful, nice girl became a monster because uh, potentially her life and her reality of her life problematics was completely ignored mm -hmm. and not admitted into the institution as mm -hmm. something uh, legitimate to talk about. But uh, that is one core of my mother's vision that the life problematic of children has to be integral to the pedagogical orientation. Mm -hmm. That it has to be in the center, like you have to help the child truly deal with hard parts of their lives. Mm -hmm. And not just 
issue the uh, poo poo them and they kind of like oh yes I really like to do nothing <laughs> as you say it was so fun mm -hmm. okay uh, and the relationships of partnership so this is uh, these are kind of like the tenants also that children and adults are be uh, relating to each other as partners. Children, teachers, parents, policy makers, everyone included in this process and practices should be partners in that process as a creative cultural process. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we all know that there are historical changes in the upbringing uh, education and care. In Serbo Croatian, it's uh, education and care is called Vaspitanje, Obrzovanje, and care is Briga. Uh, they have kind of like overlapping meanings a little bit, but upbringing is really um, uh, bringing up whole personalities, not uh, just like uh, integrating people into social life mm. as good people, as uh, knowledgeable people, as responsible people. Uh, it has a lot of ethical uh, uh, background behind that. And again, Dita Vitalikvist addressed these issues very well, almost like coming from the same ideas of uh, what upbringing is. And so we will not talk too much about that right now. And so uh, we know that uh, children folk history, throughout the whole history were living as part of families and communities, a life of production, politics, and everything. And they, uh, they were in the center of the really life of people the, as it was. And then for the historical reasons of industrial revolution, uh, where the family disintegrated as, a, as an economic and political unit, the children were also displaced and they uh, had to be put away from, from the whole uh, society. So their, uh, their role was cha changed also from an asset to a burden because children were necessary in the life and production, uh, especially in the agriculture where you, everything was manually done. You need people to work. The more children you have, the better you are off. Uh, uh, children do a lot of other work uh, that is actually not pre pretend, but actually mm -hmm. making the life possible. And suddenly they are out of place and they are just a burden. Children are very expensive <laughs> and you have to wait, find a way where they should be when you're not there with them. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of that, they became obsolete for the economic life of the society and for the political life of the society and for the moral life of society. So, uh, this is a great change. Uh, how are we going to bring them up if not as part of the family and I would add societal uh, community uh, equal members in the sense they are maybe small and ignorant is something, but they have a status there as members of the society. And so, of course, consequences is that the ch children lost the participation in the social practices uh, of real life, and uh, they also lost models and patterns of behavior in the family and community. Well, the children were uh, always witnesses of life as it was, as it was going on. They could see many people relating in different ways, in different situations. Uh, they could see what you do when you have a problem and how differently you could, these problems could be solved. It was just like a panorama of things that could go in front of their eyes. Suddenly they're out of that. And Mollenhauer was, uh, uh, Klaus Mollenhauer was talking about uh, ways of uh, uh, living through a presentation, which is the direct life, and representation, which is already processed. Uh, you, it's almost like Plato's cave. You don't see what's going on, but you see shadows of that and interpretations of that, and a filter that somebody puts on that. And you, you're not anymore, for the a large part of your life, part of that life going on. But a special life is created for you. 
children lost the possibility to create her, their own criteria for relating to, to life and human because they now are not witnessing and make, being able to make their own conclusions and figure out for themselves uh, or in the open dialogue with their peers and adults, but they are now being told what is good. And given just a fraction of the whole life problematic, that would support the adults' point of view, those who actually work on, on creating these models of the world in which children will live. So uh, societal responses were either babysitters, babysitting houses, or this institutionalization, crashes, daycares, preschool centers, kindergartens. And with institutionalization, we have something that child development becomes regulated, not with life. It's, it's not romanticizing, because life it can be very rough. And what partly the institutions do, we protect children from the roughness of the life. But these models of intervention of how to bring children up became economic and pedagogical, psychological models, something that's uh, now consciously made as a sphere of human engagement, like you can make cars or you can create uh, environments for children where to live. And the uh, make decisions, conscious decisions, was good and was bad for the children and protect them. And that's where care sometimes turns into its ugly side because protecting is also patronism. Yeah. Yeah. Because somebody else is deciding what's good and bad for you mm -hmm. and not giving you a chance to have a say in that mm -hmm. or to experience that. And maybe you need that mm -hmm. in order to actually be who you are, not just realistic. Uh, children are segregated into a separate group, and mm -hmm. they, uh, their life is now decontextualized from the social societal practices, and they also lost the participation in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. I can't go here into what's public sphere, but if you read Habermas, it's a very important uh, cultural uh, uh, place where we create our main societal opinions, meaning, it's a debate place where what's good, what's bad, how to solve dif different problems of life is being, it, that's where the decisions start to be outlined and made. So uh, all kinds of political talk, cultural talk, all kinds of products that we have that tell, tells us all kinds of these tensions uh, and very lively uh, ways of how people organize themselves, what's possible, what's legal, what's not, why it's not, is in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. Child children are not anymore part of that public sphere. Mm -hmm. They they get echoes, filtered echoes of that, and their voice is never heard in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, yes, maybe, uh, there are, I saw a lot of very beautiful things in just two kindergartens here in Norway, where children can, let's say, uh, bring their uh, uh, their model of how the new sports center that is planned to be built should look like to the planners, and they take them seriously. Mm -hmm. Or something like that. But that's very rare, and in many societies, it never even happened. And it would, did not happen at that time in the society. Uh, in, in German, this public sphere is Öffentlichkeit. Authentic sphere in Norwegian publicität, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, all our kind of like uh, very important part of who we are, how we relate, how we see the world, what's going on now, where we're we going, is being debated. And also, on the other hand, my mother didn't know this much, but she was talking and very importantly about adulthood people losing their parenting function, mm -hmm. which is an important part of an adult de development as a person, too. Mm -hmm. Caring about the younger child, uh, making decisions was good or bad, a as you, as your family and your community, and not having somebody who is telling you as an expert mm -hmm. and denigrating you as a parent, but 
with this treatment of hair, especially if you're not in the dominant class. I don't have that power. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're losing, so not only children, adults too. Uh, their child development became standardized, their normative is it? Mm -hmm. normative I can know it. Um, yes. the, uh, developmentally, uh, what do you call appropriate it? practices. Uh, appropriate <laughs> Who's practice. development? <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, we also started segregating children among, between other, among other children in the age groups mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. creating these norms where we would shoot everybody at a certain point of time. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. It became technologized and mm -hmm. the teachers became. Uh, prof I mean, the teacher professionalization, teachers are more and more becoming uh, technicians of somebody else's ideas, push button, yeah. what they have to, uh, they are also not always or less and less able to make their own decision, creative decisions at the moment mm -hmm. of the happening, but they have to follow some guidelines that, so that in effect, they are becoming technicians mm -hmm. and not professionals. Mm -hmm. Professional, like a doctor, uh, <coughs> goes and reads a lot of sources and, and makes their own decision, a unique decision for a unique patient. Not that there are some uh, general guidelines, but he, now it's, of course, we have many debates in the United States about abortion. I don't want to bring it in, but that's exactly what the uh, doctors are being put into a position that they have to, by law, even go completely against their professional uh, mm -hmm. training or whatever, being really not a technologist, but a person, professional person could be uh, somebody who uh, has uh, a possibility to make good evaluation of each <coughs> particular unique situation and make decisions based on that. That's a professional. And the, uh, so all of these are actually forces against life as being and becoming human. Mm -hmm. She had a very, very strong critique of, his, of current at that time, and in many ways today. So because it suppresses self-determination, mm -hmm. autonomy, it suppresses the unpredictability of creativity, it's suppressing authorship and agency, mm -hmm. institutionalization, and suppressing playfulness in people's relationships and practices, mm -hmm. which are necessary, again, for play, for meaning making, and good relationships all together uh, brought up like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me just, okay. So what would it mean to create a vision of early childhood education, uh, early childhood upbringing and education as an open, societal practice. How would we envision that differently than what we have now? We cannot now stop working in our industrialized society and return to family units uh, uh, and the previous uh, centuries production and uh, kind of include children in, into that life. But how we could reintegrate children? Uh, <coughs> so that would be reintegrate the children into social culture spheres of public discourse and culture. Uh, some sources, for instance, Huizinga talked about it in, with his uh, uh, Homo Ludens, uh, my mother's uh, uh, article from 1987. Mm. Uh, uh, so that the children's voice becomes part of culture making, maybe now not industrial and necessity making, but culture making. Mm. <coughs> Playmaking, creating that human uh, uh, aspect, not cutting them off of that uh, creative authorship of making yourself human. And that, for that, you need the relationships of partnership and collaboration among the adults and children. Mm -hmm. And a relationship is which through dialogue is possible, where you can really discuss, where you can really play, where you can jointly make culture, truly as partners and authors. Where play, creativity, and a sense of unique personal and unique group authorship are sources of both individual and societal development. 
So yes, so we can work on this transcendental level, even though the uh, level of uh, uh, economy uh, does not allow us to do that. Maybe we are on the brink of something like that with this uh, AI, you know, robotization. Everybody is talking about dangers of that. But if really people have truly more time, not to just labor, mm -hmm. but to uh, participate in mm -hmm. their own cultural and creative passions and include children in that, uh, that could be providing more possibilities. Now I'm saying that she was not, the, uh, she couldn't even imagine what we have mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. She died in 1986 mm -hmm. and she was not even 60 years old. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And freedom uh, to have education as a personal sphere of decision. Mm. Uh, and what, by that, I, I will talk about it a little later, the freedom for creating the meta-conceptual and reflex, uh, reflexive aspects of education as a person and as a, as a, a small group or community. And not being patronized or being forced by people who are outside of that in, in, uh, immediate praxis and life that's going on, telling what that all is and to micromanaging your life and taking away that meta-conceptual uh, aspects. And mm -hmm. self-discovery and self-determination as the main guiding principle of education uh, or agency autonomy. And we have today in Finland, in Nordic countries, much more going toward that than it is now in countries of former Yugoslavia or anywhere in the world. I don't know, maybe a little bit Reggio Emilia uh, approach on creativity that stresses that very, very, very much, but it's still embedded in the otherwise ideology of patronization. Mm. So, significance of play for human development. Uh, evolutionary humanist views were part of uh, our approach to that and the central role of play, playfulness and imagination for developing as a human being. Uh, I'll go fast because here I feel that you are on a terrain that's uh, kind of like more uh, okay, uh, more familiar. Mm -hmm. So human as a species transcends biological evolution through a flexibility complex. Uh, adapting to the environment, not by adapting the body, but by building culture. Mm -hmm. That's uh, Brunner, if you go back to that, that's Vygotsky, mm -hmm. if you go back to that. Building culture is creating your new human environment mm -hmm. for yourself to live. So symbols, language, music, art, dance, rituals, religions, ethical beliefs, tools, ways of living, the whole social cultural approach really is uh, looking into this different, not biological sphere of development, but of human sphere of development. And creativity is the paramount play of cultural development. Play is a necessary condition and practice of creativity. So human personality or human richness, uh, individual subjectivity becomes human or trans transcends the biological nature through socialization into the culture, becoming a participant and a co-author in the cultural meaningful and meaning-making life of one's community. Mm -hmm. You all believe that, you all think of the language being something that uh, you can only in an interaction and activity with, with uh, being, a, a being a, not only a user, but a maker of language. You can learn language as simple system. That is not, and that is why it also is different languages in different communities because it's arbitrary. It's uh, just like that. <laughs> Coming from a human community that has something to do with each other. Mm -hmm. And Lichnos or personality is a universe built by creative activities and practices of each individual in the society as they build one's own inner culture. So this was a huge uh, uh, talk we, 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 together with me and my mother about what's person and what's the society. And we came to the conclusion that the both are made of the same material, so mm -hmm. to speak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that actually each person is a universal culture. 
with unbelievable depths of risk that are sometimes not even known to the person themselves. And they are unique universe, different than everybody else. I'll just quickly go, and how can we make this work? I have two. <laughs> Here, okay. So this is a, like a little side thing. And now I want to connect with the last speaker in our conference with her brother, <laughs> or she connected to me, in yeah. fact, completely inadvertently. I want to talk about the, but just very quickly about Bhakti's approach to personality or Bhakti's approach to culture. So one of the things that Bhakti uh, was talking about in his many different writings is that culture does not have internal territory. A cultural universe in itself, the, the toto in parsisma, in fact, uh, I will explain why. So culture has no internal territory. One must not imagine that the realm of culture as some sort of spatial whole having boundaries, but also having internal territory. The realm of culture has no internal territory. It's entirely distributed along the boundaries. Boundaries pass everywhere, through its every aspect. The systematic unity of culture expands into the very atoms of cultural life. It reflects like the sun in each drop and of that light. Every cultural act lives essentially on the boundaries. In this, it is seriousness and its significance. Abstracted from boundaries, it loses its soul. It becomes empty, arrogant, and disintegrated and dies. And why is this important? I, I always, for a long time, have this metaphor of bubbles. And each person is a bubble, but they don't exist internally. They exist in the touch with another. Mm. Only in the touch with another, you are becoming you. Only in the, re, re, uh, in the answer to another, only in positioning yourself to another another person or another uh, cultural view, idea, desire, so you're not aware, a biological organism is not aware of their biological uh, givenness because they don't have that touch of the other that creates the spark. So you have to have this other in order to understand yourself. And that's true for culture, you know, when people did not know that they are Arab numbers, and they talked only of numbers is in terms of Roman numbers, they were natural. This is natural, like one, two, mm -hmm. three, like five, things like that. Only in connection to another culture, you, you understand that this is only one possibility among many, and then it makes you look back at your, your so to speak, solution, and uh, have this reflexive view of who you are. So if you want to see yourself as a subject and be who you are and not just be reactive in, the, in, in any uh, situation that you do things that you don't know why you're doing them but just as a kind of biological reaction then you have to have that level of meta reflection which you only can get in contact with others so then if you think of lichnos as a yeah, cultures too, and people in general. We are only as, as, as very, very, very complex people because the more other bubbles we touch, the more kind of facets. So you can think of a diamond. Mm -hmm. The more little facets a diamond has, the beautiful it's more mm -hmm. beautiful it shines. Mm -hmm. Those are my metaphors mm -hmm. for that. So I just wanted to put this, and that's a really a Slavic concept of richness. That's why Bhakti could do that. Lichnost is not an individual opposed to the society. Lichnost is society internal mm -hmm. or culture internal. Because everything we know, everything we feel as uh, humans through art, music, uh, drama, science, mm -hmm. all of that is uh, developed in touch with others. So you cannot become a human lichnost or personality you know, opposing society, but you can become in answering the society. So this is your answer to those big problems of life.
So everyone is different, has different shape, but these shapes wouldn't exist without others. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's very important because it, uh, it's very hard to, to avoid people thinking that self-determination is something uh, selfish and opposed to the society. Mm -hmm. Because here self-determination becomes a right to exist as you are and to make your own decisions as, uh, as an answer to the society or to, to the other or to your mother or to your child or to whoever is important to you in the moment to tell you no. I, this is from my perspective, I would view like that. But also I can, uh, I can acknowledge and give the uh, right to your perspective. Okay, little detour, but probably important for the later. I just been looking at, at the, uh, 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 so that's why Lichnos is a universe built by creative activities and practices of each individual in the society as they build their own inner culture. Mm -hmm. So subjectivity in itself is a creative uh, and made up uh, thing. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and it could be made up in a different way. Which we all, in a, in a way, know that if somebody's experiences were different, they would have turned out in a different way. That's true. Mm -hmm. Only we don't know how everybody will turn out because it's not causal. It's answerable, in the answerability. It's not, if I do this, this will be the, always the, the reaction to that. We don't know. And each person uh, will react in a different way and take something different from that situation at least to a small point, if not completely. Okay. So creativity and play and really, really the process of how that happens. Uh, creativity is the paramount way of cultural development and play is a necessary <coughs> condition and practice of creativity. So uh, I just want to, this is some quotes from Sanda. She brought this Ericsson's quote that child plays an infantile form of human ability to rework experiences by creating models of situations and for controlling uh, a reality through experimenting and planning, which is not completely untrue, except in this infantile. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in other words, she says, the scientific literature on creativity often looks at play as a simple prototype of a more complex phenomenon of creativity, like you have artistic creativity, it's just a simple children's play. And she critiqued it. Uh, very soon we realized that play is not at all a less complex phenomenon than creativity. In fact, like creativity, play is a phenomenon resisting contemporary methods of definition, exploration, and interpretation at that time. So she discussed the following perspectives of play, play and adaptation, structure, like characteristics of play, the effects of play on the development of psychological capabilities and characteristics, and the possibilities to cultivate play with the purposes of developing children's creative capacities. All that are really in the mainstream even today in the early childhood education. Uh, I develop, uh, and if we have time, I can present some of that, the ethical, ontological, dialogic perspective on play with, through my analysis of play through three forms of play uh, that result in this meta level of ref reflexivity that I mentioned before. But if we have time. So very quickly, adaptation, flexibility, and play. So if we then go back to the... Uh, um, evolutionary models of uh, life on Earth. Adaptation of people as a species is essentially different than all other species because we do not adapt to the, uh, to the uh, uh, given what exists, the necessities, but we create this cultural way. So man, we, she uses this uh, terminology in celebration you have to say man, which really means mensch in German, which means a human person. Mm -hmm. But it would be at that time and even today not possible to just constantly say human, so she's talking in the masculine, but it's completely invisible when you're mm -hmm. really observing. Mm -hmm. Does not adapt directly, but by processing and transforming his environment. Moreover, to man, his own human nature is not a given. But instead, it represents a behest that he is set out to fulfill. Mm -hmm. Because it's a creative process of becoming 
So if you are learning, uh, you 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 are on the quest for your life plan mm -hmm. in a creative way. Uh, biologically, we are all given. We don't we don't have a say what we are, what genes we have, and in many parts of our. Uh, subjectivity are given biologically and even socially not really unique but in general as unique persons we are on, uh, on a behest to set out to fulfill so the process of the environment uh, the, pro uh, the through the processes of environment and I added right that's not her quote a person realizes their own physical and psychological potential that is, the person establishes themselves as a human, as a person. Vicious. Um, I now change from her masculine forms into person, so that we can rub our ears today. <laughs> In English. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, of course. Uh, so the translation is really, really creative reinterpretation. So simultaneously, they also change their essential characteristics of their habitat. That is, they create their non-organic body, the culture, and the human reality. So the culture is a non-organic body in which we live as humans. And now we're talking about somebody being dead for 40 years and the ideas that are not here, invoking even older ideas. This is not where, where we are now. And even where we are is all human-made. Mm -hmm. Do you see anything natural here? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Everything is human-made. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Nothing grows from the so. Uh, the, uh, this altered the way of adaptation is, uh, as essential characteristics of humans. <laughs> so she says, we can conclude therefore that the function of play is dual. On one hand, it enables diverse uses of the capacity for flexibility. We have to be flexible creating culture. And on the other hand, it uh, yeah, prevents patterns of behavior and related psychological functions from becoming fixed and rigid. So we can still adapt. Being uh, flexible is our paramount uh, adaptational strategy. That's true for also biological organisms. Many always perish when things change in nature. Only those that are flexible and can change can. So that's a given for any evolution to survive but we do it in a cultural way. So we have to keep this flexibility and creativity and, uh, 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 and the possibility to constantly be out of the box, transcend, be different, all of that, in order to be human. Uh, so thanks to play, the psychological capabilities develop flexibility as their imminent quality. Uh, play, by the way, the Gaskin review had this in play, you create the imaginary plane or end reality, so you so, mm -hmm. somehow have a doubling of reality and imagination and importance of the rules of play also, like what goes, what not goes. Also, uh, in the symbolic or an unstructured play, uh, the rules are also uh, in the focus of creating new worlds. Mm -hmm. Like what is possible in that, like what is the rule if in our, so we are creating now a two girls are cooking, right? What is the rule here? Is the father sitting and reading newspaper or a, yeah? Okay. Yeah, so it, not only the rules between them, but rules that they imagine for that world. So it's discovering uh, what goes in that world and what not, it's negotiable there. And that's the Vygotsky view. Um, I added another, I mean, this is a quote for her, but it becomes different uh, when I talk about it. While the, the imaginary plane provides general material and psychological conditions for the transformation of experience and behavior, the rules of play directly instigate these transformations since they launch the specific act deeds in Serbocration in Russian, it's the word postupok, which is not just an act, but an act that addresses another and treats them in a certain way and uh, yeah, gives them uh, uh, importance puts them down it's just it, it has this ethical connotation so as these are leading to the realization of these transformations mm. even from Reynolds and uh, I don't have uh, now the, the quote exactly I mean the reference 
He pointed to the fact that there are particular moments when play ceases to be just a simulation of the reality and becomes a creation relevant for the light. It comes back to life. And that I think in your example, Alicia, is when the uh, Aya uh, suddenly realizes that she'll have to tell her parents to use that which she discovered. It's much more fun when they both participate, right? So it's certainly it's not just an imaginary, but you, uh -huh, you could do that. <laughs> so you create a new possibility there. Uh, she, that's a quote from Sandra. I developed, so I still have that idea, <laughs> an assumption that play is the key to understanding why and how a child can transform an existing internal urge or an external pressure or strain into an object of his own decision and will. And so, because I know that you read my uh, Anana Raini's uh, 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 paper on ambivalence, this is directly <coughs> from the uh, part of that paper, how a certain way of behavior, for, and Alicia doesn't know, so uh, the context is that uh, uh, in that episode, uh, uh, teen, teenagers in uh, Helsinki who were orphans or were given into orphanage because their parents cannot afford to raise them, who have a lot of psychological troubles, are part of a drama section that is preparing a national holiday. And one very, uh, um, uh, very troubled young man uh, whose older brother is already part of the street gangs and pop music or something. He's very ambivalent whether he wants to participate because he has to or can, uh, could maybe go out. And so he's trying to sabotage constantly what they're doing. But the genius uh, pedagogues there, whatever he's doing, they're interpreting that as his play mm -hmm. instead of punishing him, being angry with him. Oh, they say, oh, you want to just lie on the on the uh, stage instead of uh, doing something. That's an interesting way how to stage this uh, whole thing. Let's do that. And then because they turn it into a play, they give him a possibility of that distance of creating that break that, uh, where uh, now he's not being thrown into a harsh reality. He can step up and look at what he's creating as if it was play. Mm -hmm. And that potentially leads to his change. So uh, I just wanted to bring, so uh, if we have time, I'll talk more about that, but not right now. Uh, so usually pedagogical practices with play uh, uh, are part of almost all preschool education system. Uh, because the, the little children play, they need play, we all need that they thrive in play, and they could be used in two general approaches. So to directly, to direct the play towards some educational goal, to a greater or lesser degree, so the educators now take care of the limit play, and let's see how we can make play useful, because we know that it's so central for child development, but let's make this development actually relevant and good and everything, so let's use children's play. Um, the, so, depending on the concept of education, they, it could be used more or less. Uh, and this is an instrumental approach. And so, Sandra's quote here, we already know that in such circumstances, the special significance play ordinarily has for the child declines from a voluntary, irresistible, and joyful activity turn in, in turns into serious, sometimes boring, and frequently troublesome task. And she quotes Tolstoy. She says, remember that already Tolstoy visiting some Fravelli in kindergarten says that in there, children play crying. <laughs> <laughs> she was very sharp. <laughs> and, and, and her critique was very strong. And, uh, or we can leave play in its alleged natural conditions. Like, don't do anything, just let children play. They will figure it out. You don't, you should just be safeguards for, for safety, not really participate. But is that really good or not? And she invokes now Brunner saying, young children play only under certain social circumstances. And they need adult support, mutual play and conditions for various inspirational experiences. Mm -hmm. It's directly one part of Vygotskyan and Brunerian approach that went into creating or potentially creating the play worlds where adults and children play together in a certain way. 
and it is obvious that children cannot play in a vacuum mm -hmm. left to themselves. So, what is the solution for Sanda? Not for uh, anybody else. Is it possible to use children's play in order to support the development of children's creative capacities? And she talks about cultivation of the play or cultivation of pedagogy. What are we going to cultivate? Play or pedagogy? In what way and what does it mean? So, we can transfer the basic features of play to other activities, including the practice of upbringing and education. So, not use play for upbringing and education, but transform uh, upbringing and education according to the principles of play. Okay. It is necessary uh, to take opposite route, as she said. So, we should not subordinate play to the principles, but okay, I already said that. <laughs> so, in a way, support creativity and the child's personality in all activities by following principles of play in every educational practice. And so here are Sanders' principles of play. Very simple and very profound. First, play creates intimate relationships of mutuality between the children or between child and adult. So you have to understand the relationships that you want to create in the uh, uh, daycare centers are these intimate relationships with mutuality. Okay. Second, child enrollment and participation in the living experiences involve, involves both high quality indirect role models of creative behavior and rich and diverse human practices. So the children have to be exposed to the life of rich and, uh, human practices and models of cultural behavior too which means they have to be drawing everything for their play, and those of you probably agree, from the richness of the cultural life in which they live and not from the segregated uh, institutional life. And third, uh, they have to have rich and diverse contacts with peers, which means multi-generational play because children play with other children and learn a lot from older children uh, they are always exposed, if you want to say, this is living zone of course, mm -hmm. they will often. They have models there, but not what's an adult, which is completely maybe out of reach, always, especially because the adults are not working in the same situation, but the children talk with each other, they fight with each other, they create interesting things, and you need not to be confined to your generation at all. Today, Peter Gray, I don't know if you know the name, is uh, uh, developing very strongly views about a necessity of multi-generational play mm -hmm. and life of children. Mm -hmm. And the children have to have opportunities to be alone, shielded from the public, and given space for non-surveyed personal and intimate needs, feelings, and thoughts. Mm -hmm. So in other words, you have to have these reflective spaces where you can just think about things, either as a group or as a person, and step out uh, in order to have that kind of like a perch from which you can process everything, not maybe even in plan. I added more, uh, and uh, either I talk about it right now or a little bit later, but I want to do it later if we go that way. If not, I'll return to that. I create more principles. <laughs> Mm. Okay, so now my question for you, where do you want to go? We can go two ways in my presentation, <laughs> because we cannot go both. Mm. One way is to talk about this open societal uh, 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 ECUA practice through an example in Belgrade, how it actually worked in life, and I can present that, mm. and that will conclude our, because it will be necessary or do you want to uh, go to explore a little bit more about my biological ontological uh, approach to play up to you <laughs> we cannot do both <laughs> I, I wonder i'm just throwing this in there as something to consider because you've presented such deep richness of the theorizing of the practices that that your mother was embedded in i'm really curious about what was going on 
at that time to better understand it. And then can we also have the other afterwards over over coffee? (laughs) 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 But anyway, it's just a thought. (laughs) Don't know what everyone else is curious about. What do you think? YouTube, what do you think? Video, what do you think? I'm also interested in um, an an example. An example. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's fine. (laughs) <laughs> so, uh, but then also to talk about this, <laughs> yeah. but maybe over if maybe we have lunch okay. together. So yeah. I'll just come back in a second to this. Uh, it is just one slide. Of, this is just more principles of play that come from my approach. So, what is play for the players? Ontological view is not for, from outside, but it's also for the significance and meaning for the children. So for the players, play has an ontological, lifeful meaning. It addresses something that is important for, to them in some way, mm-hmm. not something that is important to somebody else. Mm-hmm. Okay, people play something that's important in some way. It doesn't. It could be any different way, but ontologically, in the sense, it's for their being. It's not for their learning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's voluntary play. Is mutually voluntary practice for the players. To a certain extent, also I have to add. But if you don't want to play with somebody, nobody can make you play. They could make you play, you can sabotage that constantly. Or if you're not allowed to play by a group of people, it's hard to get into. So it has to be mutually voluntary agreement in to a certain extent, but always there. Uh, in the play, and now I'm questioning that, but I thought that people have equal rights. Players treat each other as having equal rights. That means all have a right to suggest new ideas, rules, themes, transformations, etc. Et they may not have equal power, I would add to that, to actually assert their uh, rights to do that, and probably not always have equal power. And uh, But they should be considered to be equal rights, because if you can suggest something to play, then who are you in that play? Okay, so that's uh, addressing the, the, the democracy in education. Uh, act deeds or post books are both concrete and symbolic, and that's another very important thing. That what you're doing is always this dual interpretation: is concretely treating other people and symbolically uh, representing treat- possible treatments of other people. So this ethical and what you actually are doing. Ideas have to be practically expressed and realized through verbal, non-verbal activities that simultaneously impact players' relationships. A community of players is the, all of that uh, mm-hmm. of mine. And the construction of the imagined chronotop. So simultaneously what we're doing with ourselves and what's happening in that imagined playful chronotop. So everything that you do has to uh, uh, negotiation and deliberation is act, uh, that goes in communicating players actually is this meta chronicle <laughs> is this you're building your uh your viewing stand from which you can world view the world yourself and the others through this negotiation and that's why community of players that has to have this voluntarity that has to have this uh, uh, democracy in a way is the place where meta reflexive uh uh, abilities first start. And so think about all of that. That should be also principles of pedagogical practice in addition to what Sandra was developing. So mm-hmm. that's just the end of my play <laughs> development. But we will go into a... Uh, okay, so in Belgrade, in the same years, there was a uh, uh, several institutions for young children, but specifically I'll talk about one, that were created as cultural centers for, for children, where they uh, really worked with children in terms of partners. It was not teachers teaching children, it was people who were painters, actors, writers, computer specialists, uh, physical education, uh, or movement people, ballet, and things like that, who uh, came to work with children to create joint project, joint art and cultural projects. Okay. So, like when you go to a museum, 
or you go to a cultural center if in your country there are such things. You can choose, you, you go somewhere to hear a lecture or to see an ex exhibition or to participate in some fun workshop or play chess or something like that. So it's not a school. Mm -hmm. And so it's what's called Shkoligritsa or play school. Uh, but from the 50s until today, uh, Yugoslavia was on the mar main, uh, margins of mainstream education and th through many, I mean, not Yugoslavia, these kinds of approaches to pre preschool education were not mainstream, mm -hmm. they were margin. Mm -hmm. okay. They were after school or uh, who could go in this preschool uh, cultural center which operated every day from 8 to 12, for four hours. Usually people, children who had somebody else to take care of them, grandparents or a parent not working or something. So it's already a selected group of, of children. And the whole uh, yeah, movement you could call from the 50s on, in one word, a cultural movement in Yugoslavia at that time, you can call by this honorable children. In everything, in the uh, TV shows that were created for children, in the books for children. Actually, this was a title of the first book of poems for children by a very, very beloved author in Yugoslavia, Dushko Radovic, for adults and children too. So you could characterize that the atmosphere, the spirit, the, the gist of the times for people who worked uh, and collaborated, let's say, with my mother's uh, um, life in a way because she was in the center of creating culture for children mm -hmm. were people who all somehow were creating this new life for children honor of the, the children would be honored and whereas children or students have different rights and status in terms of social cultural academic political ways and so here is the example so Shkoligritsa, which means school play was situated in a building very central in Belgrade uh, so you can see that. And the, uh, I want to specifically uh, present this work of one artist, Borutville, who uh, was there for about eight years and who said the children completely changed him as an artist, mm -hmm. always. Today he's a professor of art at the University of the Arts in Belgrade. And the, uh, so that's how he looked then. And uh, we can analyze the children's social, cultural, academic, and political status in that center. So it was called Studio for Creative Education for Preschool Children. And uh, that's where it was situated. This was its emblem, <laughs> which was created by Borat Well. And later on, you'll see a many children's drawing. Uh, where even with that, you see that he is integrating them with a uh, cultural historical world of, of European art, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We have here Leonardo da Vinci in child's interpretation. <laughs> uh, so this new concept uh, and practice uh, in, uh, in in the uh, principal education. Here we have mm -hmm. some sort of illustration. So at that time, there was a research done on what Shkoligritsa is. This is from one movement creative uh, uh, workshop at that time. So our, uh, our researcher says Shkoligritsa is true school of creative play for the children attending, but it also becomes the true school of creative work for all those adults dedicated to arts and creativity who work or wish to work with younger ones. Mm -hmm. So it was, everybody develops their creativity, adults and children. And that's from a publication in Belgrade. And so how did it work? So children from four to six years old could attend five days a week for half a day, four to five hours. Artists, musicians, dancers, writers, actors, directors, uh, theater directors and, and movie directors, psychologists and educators called by the children and others, associates. They're not called chief teachers, but associates, because they were, um, or co-workers, su saradnici, I don't know how that would be in Polish, su saradnici, uh, associates, okay. Uh, yeah, it doesn't matter. So they were usually, most of them were young professionals who wanted to author creative projects with children. 
and other colleagues. They wanted to experience working with children in, uh, in their arts of their own personal and professional growth. And they uh, also children had the right to freely choose what activities they want to experience, create, and share every day. Mm. Okay? All activities also were negotiated between the associates and the children based on everyone's interests. So, freely choose means yes, so you want this mutually a voluntary approach. So, if a child is dropped off by her grandparents or parents, they are so little they cannot choose to walk out, but they can still choose not to do anything or hang out someplace or choose where to go. I want to go to Borut, I want to go to Ljubica, I want to go uh, to play piano or whatever, creative movements whatever they wanted. And also what they are doing in these projects were joint projects. So the guiding principle was the freedom of choice and non-choice, as I explained. And for children it meant children could choose to participate in any offered workshop, children could choose not to participate in any activities at all, and they could choose to hang out with friends or alone in open areas of the center and other spaces, just kind of creating their own play or asking somebody to read them a book or something like that. Completely non-structured. And for the associates, it meant that they could feel, freely create and offer their projects and workshops based on their professional and personal interests, knowledge and skills, and the children who were there. Mm -hmm. So there were no mm -hmm. uh, rules, laws that would tell them that they have to achieve any goals or have to do this or that. That, that, that was their creative cultural project at that moment. It could be in uh, visual art, music, drama, creative movement, English. Yeah, they had a lot of learning English, mm. open workshop that was completely uh, kind of like, what are we good? What do we want to do? And then they create whatever they want to do. Uh, this, uh, the organizationally, uh, there was a space with several rooms on two floors. Uh, there were some more open, some closed times, it was flexible. Uh, the time was always uh, had its flow from the opening activities, bridge, bridging this transition from home to the center, through conversation, stories, songs, drums, etc., to more common activities in three age related groups. They had to fulfill at least the modicum of the laws of uh, Yugoslavian preschool education, so they had to have a small part where they were doing uh, creative workshops, but geared toward the goals of education that were from. But that was just a small part, half an hour to 45 minutes, and then the rest of that were these creative workshops. And then they had uh, that, and at the end, there were also different kinds of playful activities, traditional games, inventive games, as the children were into somebody picking them up and something like that. And groups were dynamically formed by the children, open choice of activity associates, like some children love to go only to the one person, and they changed. They were not always the same people. Board stayed for eight years, some people stayed for longer, le less long for one project, for more projects, and so it depended on their life. And uh, some children choose to do things because their best friend is going there. So. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, all right, so it was very flexible how they found that. And so what was Školigritza through the eyes of Borut, the art? And so I'm going to present you one of his projects. Mm. Okay, so here's the first one that you can visually see Borut standing uh, on a desk. Mm. <laughs> and everybody else standing on a desk, yeah. looking at the maps that they were creating on the floor. Mm. So kind of like... Let's see, they're all artists, they created something, so let's see it from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, uh, just to, 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 they were doing a lot of cutouts, paper, mm -hmm. machés, all kinds of things. Uh, this is, uh, they created the map, these roads, and that's some part of that, they, they were trying to map how mm -hmm. it is, and then moving through the space there. And the, uh, uh, specifically, I want to present this art project called The Artist and the Child, Keepers of the Map. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was an exploration of the prehistoric life of people. Mm -hmm. ah. Okay. So uh, here you see a child. This is 
the photographs are from a video which is in very terrible condition from the <laughs> from the 80s so they are sometimes always blurry more or less but this one was a very moving video so they are mm -hmm. here in the cave if you can see that they created out of paper mache mm -hmm. okay so borut uh created this whole project in the spring semester of 1992 uh, and then presented this project to the public. I just put here to illustrate a little bit more of the children's drawings of, mm -hmm. of this mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. they, they yeah. 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 yeah, and they had many every year, every year they would be drawing them. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, so, <laughs> so th this is also from the beginning of planning that project where he and the one boy are planning how they will organize everything. So the both of them very engaged, uh, as you see, together mm -hmm. in what is going to be. Uh, and uh, at the end of the semester, the project was presented to the Belgrade public. Mm -hmm. This is one of the most prestigious art galleries in the center city, mm -hmm. Belgrade, where they had a 14-day exhibition which was a process exhibition. It started with the empty gallery. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, at, the, at the end, every day they had workshops with the different artists that joined them, that borrowed them, and they invited to do uh, more different aspects of the world. And uh, so the gallery was filling up. But not only that, uh, uh, yeah, I said that, uh, the, each workshop was recorded on a giant map on one of the gallery walls. So you have the gallery, which was a huge space, and on one of the walls there was a huge ten, uh, uh, kind of like panel on which they were mapping everything that they were doing during the day. So that became the big map of their whole 12 days exhibition because mm. it's a process exhibition. Okay. Um, and it, when it ended, there was a, a, a celebration of not closing but opening because they, that's oh. now the exhibition. Yeah. <laughs> and they had to open at the end. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so first they were doing the whole semester, creating that uh, world of prehistoric people. There are some photographs from that time where they were creating like a fire. They also did that in the most real fires mm -hmm. and then the representational <laughs> fire. They started mapping their cave with paper and the, uh, the, this paper was all then also painted and a lot of paper mache went into that. It was much more elaborated than I had photographs to show you because there were stalagmites, there was the, oh, the, whole, oh. the whole room in the center, not in the gallery, became this cave mm -hmm. in which they were living. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then when the gallery started, they transferred one part of that actual cave into the gallery. Mm -hmm. So here you see adult people trying to transfer, and this is the map. Mm -hmm. And so that was from the first day when they mapped that there was their cave appeared mm -hmm. in the gallery. And every day they had different artists and of course, this gallery has big windows, and uh, it had a huge uh, uh, announcement of what they uh, So you see the uh, Leonardo da Vinci's mm -hmm. movie. Many, many people were passing and mm -hmm. looking mm -hmm. into what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's one grandmother taking her to. Uh, they were just, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you just pass there like you would pass in the center city something, and let's see what is going on. Uh, while inside, the children were working on the projects every day uh, and talking about what they want to do next in their uh, in their fireplace in the cave. Okay, they were planning there, and the uh, this is one uh, other artist that worked with them one day, creating giant bugs, but not cutting the paper, but just tearing the paper. Mm -hmm. If you wouldn't have any scissors, how would you create bugs? Mm -hmm. And so they were all discussing that. And uh, doing that video uh, gives a very good. So in, uh, anybody could also come in mm -hmm. uh, from those that were outside. They could come inside. This is one sibling mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, watching what's going on. Yeah, all the ice cream. <laughs> 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 yes. <laughs> 
<laughs> if you want to think about integration into the public sphere, yeah, here yeah. is the public sphere. Yeah. A new mm. exhibition, everybody can come in to talk with them. They are talking, they are saying what they want. Their art process is a part of the cultural uh, milieu of the center city mm. of Belgrade. Uh, Borut was also working on his giant black uh, dragon. Uh, Mm -hmm. That was another boy looking from outside, a teenage boy eating <laughs> <laughs> and inside children. So this is just to, to tell you how that looked. Mm -hmm. And of course, at the end, every evening when the children were already in bed, there were not other talks with the, those artists that worked and other people from psychology department and education department and whoever wanted to, they had uh, dialogues and discussions about what is this going on for child education. So mm -hmm. it was not just for the children, it was directly also for the adults to see how they could transform conventional child institutional center, yeah. what could be done what what's going on here you know like they have many many topics to discuss then uh, so what is education as a cultural offer and what kind of rights children have there and what's their status first of all you see that it was uh, uh, oh, free uh, it, it's uh, there is a freedom to be not an object of pedagogical action but to be the subject of pedagogical life, let's say, or uh, cultural life in a, in an institution. It's an institution, but of a different kind. Uh, it was open because it was also integrated uh, with uh, everybody else from the cultural sphere uh, who was interested in that in many different ways, so that that practice became like a cultural happening, like you would have here. Um, some uh, kind of like uh, exhibition or it was open during the whole semester because a lot of psychologists and educators were coming to see what's going on in, in the, in investigating that so it was kind of part of their own learning and development and uh, it was all based on creativity and play uh, you can say that children were reintegrated into social cultural spheres of public discourse mm. and there was a definitely a relationship of partnership between Borut and them and between everybody in the center and the children in the sense that everything that is a product there is a product of mutual negotiations, creativity, like, oh, how is this going to look or that and why and what's going on and we want to learn more about, well, that they were learning about stereotypes and because he mentioned, he showed me some pictures and I mean, there was a lot more going on than what you can see. Mm -hmm. And so where relationships uh, uh, that were created were really creating true dialogue uh, among people who kind of meet head to head mm -hmm. <laughs> about mm -hmm. like, what are we going to do here and make here. And uh, play, creativity, and the sense of unique personal authorship are sources of both individual and societal development in this case. And self-discovery and self-determination is the main principle of education. And that is it. Wow. I'm not going to go, I only have one more slide if you're interested in that. My future stu further studies and what would Sandra think of that? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Have we got time? That'd be nice. Yeah. 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 What would Sandra think? Yeah. Mm. Okay, and then you can kind of continue with what would the Godski think? What <laughs> oh, yeah! Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That'd be a nice yeah. dialogue for lunch. Yeah. 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 So, what would Bakhtin say? Yeah. Yeah. What would Bakhtin say to that? Yeah. What, and yeah. what do you think? But I want to actually flee from this. Even Plaza. Yeah. 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 I could describe my role, my yeah. professional development from interest in individual meaning making to dialogic relationships as cons consciousness with equal rights, mm. or with people as consciousness with equal rights. So my doctoral dissertation was Metaphor Beyond Play on child, uh, child creative uh, language and creativity in play. 
I studied with Sterling Dalbrid and uh, very much in discussion with my mother and so she was very happy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she would have died before I finished my doctoral dissertation, oh. but I think she would have been very happy and proud yeah. with that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Plus a lot of examples, my ethnographic material was from her grandchildren, my children, nephews oh. and things like that. So she knew and she based some of her article on children's creativity and adult also on <laughs> these same oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> nice connection. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the three concepts of play, imagine mm -hmm. reality and community mm -hmm. of players. Mm -hmm. Since I add this third sphere, which Schusbo also creates staging sphere, I mm -hmm. call the pre uh, community of play. Mm -hmm. She didn't know about that. The, at that time, when she was still alive, I didn't think about it, but oh, it was just a germ of that. Um, Yes, it was just a germ of that. Uh, and she would probably be very happy about that. <laughs> and, and, and draw from my studies. And because and, and, they so integrate with everything that I presented in her approach. And it's her approach to my point of view. So it's important for me. That was a uh, important uh, for my development. Mm -hmm. Then I uh, st study... Uh, and created this ontological, biological approach to play, play as post epoch which I wrote with Jane White together. There is a paper, I don't know if you know about that no, paper. No, no, no. I could give you a, a link mm -hmm. later on. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that whole play is, uh, is uh, uh, analyzed from the point of view of the ethical deed. Mm -hmm. Not from the cognitive, but exactly from this ontological, mm -hmm. uh, biological approach. A play is possible, possible is ethical act deed. Mm -hmm. okay? I think uh, so. I study their addressivity and responsibility of players, who they address, what they address, what their responsibility to the others and to the, uh, to the imaginary creation is. And I'm still working on that in some way, but I think that would be also very, very, very uh, well uh, approached by my mother. Then uh, I have a study with Eugene Matusel on biologic approach to creativity, where we reformulated creativity in a biologic way. And I think that uh, there is an article I could give you. I think she would be very surprised and mm -hmm. not know what to think about it. <laughs> it's not negative. Mm -hmm. but, wow. Okay, wow. Mm -hmm. What is that? Yes. Okay. Not surprised. <laughs> All right. Then uh, I uh, developed together with Eugene, because uh, my work became very connected to Eugene Matusov's studies of pedagogy. Yeah. And I always told him, now you're my mother, like he's <laughs> <laughs> And you are now becoming my mother, because uh -huh. that kind of connection and intellectual, intellectual uh, way of exploring the world, I, only, I, I was very lucky to find somebody with whom mm. I can have that kind of relationship. And so uh, we actually think uh, today that the dialogic and social cultural paradigm are not the same paradigm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you cannot say opposite because paradigms, they never meet. They are not on the same level. They are kind of different way. Mm -hmm. But looking from the dialogic paradigm on everything that's going on in education is very different than looking from the social cultural point of view, even if we sometimes use the same ter terminology. And we could talk about it some other time. And I think that would blow her mind. <laughs> she should be probably very worried about it. <laughs> okay. Uh, democratization of education and democratic schools, uh, which are my uh, uh, last uh, 10 years' interest uh, and studies. She would go like, hmm, <laughs> okay, we don't know what to think about it, but not negative either. I don't think she would be negative anywhere. Uh, education as owned by the student, self-education in the ex uh, ex experimental gymnasium in Oslo. Uh, mm -hmm. This is in the in that new special issue uh, of education where I started changing my methods of research or art of research, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this deep in-depth micro analysis of person idea uh, in that uh, democratic movement. I think she would go like, yes, but she would be like, like the cat, like, wow, I don't know. 
<laughs> Biologic research art, person idea, and soul search in the soul searching assembly in first sex pregnancy in Oslo. Mm -hmm. I think that she, she would also very be like, like, yeah. 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 yeah, and the uh, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Wow. So that's my reprise of my guest lecture. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Thank you so much. Mm. That's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Mm. <laughs> it's so much to take in. Mm. Yeah. Yes, we have been thinking this. Yeah. We talked yeah. about yeah. Uh, every. Uh, I think, yes. What do you think Vygotsky would say? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> what do you think Piaget would say? Piaget would just came. He would just come with his matrixes and uh -huh. he would take uh, out the children. <laughs> he, would, he would take the children out to his laboratory to. To measure if you if they are able to, to take the perspective of uh, the other person. <laughs> yeah, to create. What, would play, what, what does the doll uh, see? Yeah, he yeah. would. He would mm -hmm. Yeah, I would. I, I think that he would abstract them from their environment. Mm -hmm. but, it, but I think what I when you said Habermas, and then the debate. Mm -hmm. I think that what you are showing is not kind of very much, or it is a bit connected, but it's much more than Habermas' conception of the public space yes. with a debate mm -hmm. as a medium of participation. Mm -hmm. Because when you said Habermas, dialogue, debate, and, and then a dead man's conception, dead white man's conception of a public then I thought, oh, then I'm disagreeing, even even I uh, do not know I what the project is. I criticize Habermas, but I just wanted for, for situating the whole what public sphere concept is. There is so much, but I disagree with Habermas, but by yeah. principle myself. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, yeah, because there are some dilemmas that mm -hmm. if, if to understand public space as, as he did, it would require for the children to adjust very much, to, to be acculturated, to be kind of to learn the means of participation in order to be in the public space, which would mean that children will be in a way assimilated, denied to be children in order to be in the public sphere. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. I would rather say then we need those ghettos of early childhood education and care mm -hmm. to create environments where the children can participate on their own terms. Mm -hmm. And by establishing these small places for children where they can participate by their own means of articulation, expression, and not only a rational dialogue, mm -hmm. then I think it's... But, but what you said, it wasn't like children being equipped with... To, it was, it was a, a medium on the borderline. And mm -hmm. um, so I think that, that it was much more of affirmation of childhoods and of the children's way, ways of being in the world than pushing them in a public sphere. It, uh, it was a dialectic between the yeah. public yeah. space yeah. adjusting to the yeah. ways of children's articulations, expressions, yeah. so I think this exhibition and yeah. the whole way how Borut works with yeah. them is creating public sphere with children on all levels from including them in exploring Leonardo, exploring history as a uh, as a content of their uh, creative work with him to uh, having them really publicly uh, like like adults have a real exhibition it's not pretend it's not for mm -hmm. little children it's not like cutie cutie mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. uh, and also work in the open space of that gallery where everybody is going this uh, it's the reality and it's also how this whole um, center operated on a daily basis. You know? Yeah, that this this is I think the because you were saying about the ghettos, I, I think that um I think these children have had because of because of that center, mm -hmm. that culture, have already developed the culture of how to yeah. how to be how to how to and the adults as well together have created ways of being that are which are in many ways then just moved into more of the public eye, mm -hmm. because they've really had developed the skills mm -hmm. of how to do that. And even examples, you, I mean, it was lovely the way you 
brought us into the public zone by first of all showing us how the children stood on the table with the artist mm-hmm. view down. Mm-hmm. So in many ways it's kind of almost, I mean, maybe it's not a metaphor, but it's kind of a, a way of capturing that really rich dynamic of those children then moving. Mm-hmm. And what I really like about this is that it's 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 not, it, the process is being, mm-hmm. and then I love the idea of that you open it at the end. Yeah. <laughs> I just, you turn, you're flipping it and yeah. it's just so amazing to think this was happening mm-hmm. so long ago. Yeah, yeah. it's just incredible. So I think I think, but I think it's a really important. It's a really important. Um, I mean, it. Your mother had obviously theorised it, but the public nature of it. Um, you know, I think that's what you're saying, Alicia. There is. We need more than. We need even more theorising of it to, yeah, to understand it in contemporary that. science. Unfortunately, yeah. she really died prematurely. Yeah. Many aspects of her work are not finished. It's just indicators and mm. stay in my memory of our talks uh, and, mm. and not all yeah. in her notes that were never accomplished. Yeah. 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 And so, um, yeah. Also, this, um, I'm very, this concept of ditch lost. Mm-hmm. Did I say that correctly? Co- very lost. correct. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it made me reflect on. Um, a concept actually from the Philippines, which Jean and I wrote about, mm-hmm. um, which is the um, the heart of Filipino psychology, which we call Psikolohe Filipino, mm-hmm. um, and it's called Kapwa. Kapwa is the, and we actually have a sort of like oh. a visualization of it. Mm-hmm. The Kapwa, so you're a person, this is mm-hmm. oneself, mm-hmm. but Kapwa comes from being entangled with somebody else or being entangled to another entity. And mm-hmm. that's how you exactly. become. Mm-hmm. And you're never you're never really separate from mm-hmm. your kapwa. Mm-hmm. It's necessary mm-hmm. that you engage mm-hmm. with somebody mm-hmm. or another entity yeah. to develop oneself. Mm-hmm. And I guess it's also very much related to the um, concept of binigum or landlord, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. which is here in this um, yeah. context, is very much. Mm-hmm. But it, it so what's making me it, it's making me reflect that actually a lot of our societies and cultures, even those that are um, unheard of in Southeast Asia or a lot mm-hmm. in different contexts, ex Yugoslavia in Serbia, we have this very powerful. Um, uh, conceptualizations already that we are Mm -hmm. starting to revisit and I think it's beautiful that Mm -hmm. it's now coming up to Mm -hmm. the more mainstream um, Mm -hmm. languages of education and research and science and Mm -hmm. culture building and Mm -hmm. um, knowledge building also Mm -hmm. because it's we don't really talk about it that much because it's dominated by yeah, you even forget, you know, and then we, we translate Lisha as this person, and then there is a lot of uh, literature in English about person development, personality. Mm-hmm. And then uh, after many, many years, uh, Eugene and I uh, suddenly realized that actually uh, talking about constantly individual social mm-hmm. invaded the concept of personality to mean something separate from the society, something alone, something selfish, something with different ideas. Uh, uh, interest than the whole society and in opposition, but it's not. Mm-hmm. If you go from the idea of uh, mm-hmm. of lichnos, also the word lichnos, I don't know if you know, uh, I don't know how it's written Polish, but it's in Russian too. It comes from a, um, uh, a word lichina, which means mask. Oh, which means how you present yeah, the others, so, yeah. uh, not to, to hide, but what you present, mm-hmm. and then you have the whole theory, Goffman's theory behind that, mm-hmm. how you create your own self presentations to yourself and to the others. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. subjectivity is always on that surface, mm-hmm. uh, in in the gaze of yourself and the gaze of others. Mm-hmm. And so if you think of that as constant creative process of being negotiated, because in every moment we really have these uh, yeah, dilemmas, whether I should do it this way or that way, or uh, or how would they appear, mm-hmm. and especially in situations that are complex where different publics come to, to watch us, for whom we would present different maybe personalities, mm-hmm. not only present, but be different people, mm-hmm. very rich maybe even in contradiction, and mm-hmm. then find mm-hmm. ourselves in contradiction of being the Irish, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
And that, that's really interesting because it then starts to bubble up the fact that the, the social context and the, the culture of which you which you might be entering, you know, like if it's a if it's this forum or we go to another context, um, really matters in the in this sense of self and and sense of other and how other is sensing you. Um, it becomes a very um, it becomes a very rich a part, and I could see that in your mother's work because it was it was was really and you had some beautiful words to try and describe that and then when you got to your metaphor of the bubbles mm-hmm. um it was trying to I was for bring it out further how is it possible and then i think when i thought of the bubbles i thought mm. of, the, uh, of the, the having many facets the more different experiences with different people and different cultural mm-hmm. artifacts mm-hmm. you become shinier and shinier like mm-hmm. a, a bubble or like a diamond mm-hmm. and that means it's strengthening you yeah. i mean your simple one bubble is undefined mm-hmm. to be honest. It's just like a little child actually starts from being single. Mm-hmm. And with reintegration becomes more complex and in the sense more autonomous because uh, because we talked about the internalization of these social things. I think it's not only internalization, but it's an internalization with this constant um, answering uh, uh, of uh, how you are challenged in life, like somebody does something. You, in, there is no simple imitation. Again, we had some presentations in this uh, wonderful conference about imitation uh, and is it only imitation or that? Because uh, it, uh, there was a, a wonderful uh, paper, I don't know if you were in that presentation about that, uh, dark children's drawings. Oh, sorry. I have to go, do we? Yeah, yeah, dark yeah. Ch- yes, yes. Where yeah. she said at one moment, is it the children's critique of the society? They are presenting not only what they know, but how they see the world as a critique, mm-hmm. which is a response. We not never mm-hmm. completely just uh, uh, are uh, blotting paper that uh, things just fall on us. We mm-hmm. respond to that. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes us us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's where we have to have the boundaries. And that's why the boundaries are what gives us an opportunity mm-hmm. to see from the double perspective. And that's uh, yeah. in my theory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Double yeah. perspective is great. Yeah. yeah. And it's dynamic yeah. and it's and it's changing. And it's ethical also yeah. because it's also yeah. How you relate to your co-creators uh-huh, uh-huh, and uh-huh. how what you're creating with yeah. them for them. Yeah.